Welcome back to Beyond the Helmet. I'm your host, Steve McGrath, and in this episode, I'm pleased to bring you my conversation with Terrence Wheatley. Now, Terrence was a second-round pick of the New England Patriots back in 2008, and unfortunately, his football career was cut short due to a couple of wrist injuries that he had, but he tore it up at the University of Colorado. He's all over the record books there, and he's going to tell us about his story through college, what it was like battling through those injuries, getting into the NFL, and then how he transitioned out of the league, where he did spend four years working as a brand manager for the Dallas Cowboys, and what he's doing now, working for Tavis. And if you don't know who they are yet, they are the lead dog in developing technology for better tackling analytics. So they're going to change the game in terms of safety. I'm going to let him tell you about all that. So without any more, without any further ado, rather, here is T. Wheat. I am pleased to be joined by Terrence Wheatley, former New England Patriot, a, a man whose career has only continued to go up from there with everything he's done after the game as well. Terrence, how's it going today, man? It's going good. I got, uh, I got three young ones over there uh, acting crazy because of COVID, but uh, I'm sure we're not the only ones uh, in that same boat, but uh, life is good. I got no complaints. So have you put on uh, maybe a couple of different hats, principal, gym teacher, maybe, you know, a couple other subjects in there as well? <laughs> when you got, when you got three kids under three and a half, you wear every hat. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. I just, I, I wear everything, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been good so far. It's been nice to be at home and, and be with the family. Yeah. I, I didn't realize it was three under three and a half. That's a whole different ball game right there. Got my hands full. <laughs> yes, you do. Th thank you so much for, for taking the time because now I understand how hard it, it actually was for you to <laughs> get a couple of minutes away. It's it's always interesting when I take uh, take calls in my office because they know where my office is. <laughs> so whether it's locked or not, uh, you know, you may hear them banging on the doors. Absolutely. Yeah, I hear that all too well. That, that work from home uh, is certainly affecting everyone. I, I don't think there's been a call made in the last two months where there hasn't been some sort of door knocked on or something falling over. Um, but oh, man, sure. I, that's, the, that's, that's the nature of the beast, right? Yeah, right. Uh, control what you can control. It's all you can do. Exactly. Um, you know, I, uh, just as Victory Sports is in the football education space, you know, Atavis is a company that, that we had come across. Uh, so when I learned that you were the director of, of partnership there, and I think that's your title, please correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. Um, you, you know, I, I jumped on being able to speak with someone that understands data and how that can really impact the game. So can you just speak a little bit about what you're doing now? Yeah, yeah, so uh, I'm the Director of uh, Corporate Development and Partnerships uh, for Adivis Football, uh, which I just joined actually, uh, gosh, probably six months ago, so I'm, I'm, still, I'm still new to it. <laughs> uh, but previously I was with another company uh, that made head impact monitors inside of a mouthpiece, so I was uh, still kind of relatively in the same space before. Uh, but one thing that I really liked about what we're doing here at Adivis was we're not just giving data, we're giving data that you can act upon. Um, and I think that is kind of the struggle for a lot of these companies is, you know, having data is great, but if it doesn't paint the complete picture of what happened, um, then you can't really do anything with it, right? It's just a bunch of numbers. Like, what do those, what do those numbers mean? Um, so for us to be able to break down the tackle, every tackle uh, that happens in a game and give specific data points to coaches, uh, to athletic directors, um, and then give some insights with that to where they can make an actionable decision. And maybe sometimes that action is to do nothing, um, you know, is, is very powerful stuff. Um, you know, and, and I think that's kind of the, the, the future of, of sports. Um, and I think the, the future for Adivis and, and with all of our clients and everything that we're doing, I think the, the future for us is pretty bright. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, just, we live in an age where, where there is so much data. Or we're, we're finding new ways to collect it all the time. It feels like, but but for you to got for you guys to be sort of leading that charge in finding a way to you know implement it in football, uh, certainly a sport where, where there is a lot of money that's generated and a lot of money spent. Um, but the the key being that actionable data piece uh, to be able to give any institution act, information that they can make decisions on. I, I mean, that is the difference between you just being a, a company in a company that can lead the charge. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, when you look at data and you look at what we provide, right, it's, it's kind of a, a twofold type of deal, the way I, I approach it. 
Um, number one, I'm only going to talk to coaches if I feel like the data that we provide in or service will help them win our ball game, right? If, if I can't do that, and, and regardless of what company you are, to be honest, um, if you can't improve the level of performance, uh, whether it's from the players or the coaching staff, um, then they're probably not going to be interested. And, and realistically, you're not helping them at all. Uh, but then, two, when you look at football in particular, you look at the safety concerns that have been out there uh, with concussions recently in the past years, regardless of how you feel about it, um, for us to be able to give data and show them that, hey, if you – not necessarily – 100% adopt, I and mean, we would love for, for uh, a team to or organization to 100% adopt what we do and what we believe in. Um, but the data backs up that what we're doing works. So, you know, we, we track, you know, how many times you go to make a tackle, and the first thing that impacts it is your head. Uh, but we've, we've shown with, uh, with all our teams a reduction in that. Um, so I think what makes us a little bit different is, you know, not only are we telling you how many times you know, your head is impacted trying to make a tackle, but now we are able to correct the problem with some of the other data points that we provide. You know, and the nice thing is, is you're able to then input that into your own video system, whether it's XOs or DB Sport or Puddle, and now you can start to break it down by, you know, when does it happen and what part of practice is this happening? And now you can start to manage practice. That's where the AD comes in, right? Or the, the head coach or whoever's planning the practice. Um, so it kind of paints that, complete picture of, okay, what is going on? How do I fix it? Do I need to fix it? What is the culture going on uh, within the organization? And that's, that's powerful, valuable stuff, right? As opposed to just saying, hey, this guy got hit in the head at 50 Gs, rotational force was, you know, 4,400. Uh, those numbers, unless you're a researcher, doesn't mean anything, right? Um, you know, as a coach, you know, okay, cool. How do, how do I fix that? Um, and that's what we do at Adivis is, you know, we're able to break down each tackle and, and you know, give the, the positives and, and, and minuses uh, for, for each guy that, that goes in there. Um, and that allows the coaches to really hyper focus on, on something that happens on every single play. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sold. I, I think it's such a great idea. It's such a huge step forward that I, you know, I, I think that the future is tremendously bright. So, uh, wh where's the best place for people to find more information about it? Yeah, if you just go to adivis.com uh, and, and go to our website, uh, we have a bunch of videos up there. Uh, obviously, you can contact me directly. You know, my email is terrence.wheely at adivis.com, um, and we'll be happy to, to provide a demo. Um, you know, go to, uh, to LinkedIn. Uh, there's a bunch of guys on there that, uh, you know, they'll do podcasts like this and they'll have a couple uh, Zoom calls where they're doing webinars and things like that. Um, you know, but reach out to us. You know, we're, we're happy to work with anybody and everybody that's, that's willing to listen. At the end of the day, we're just trying to improve, right? That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to get everybody to improve as a, as a player, as a coach, as an organization. You know, I'm a firm believer in, if, if you think that you've figured it out, then, you know, you're, you're just selling yourself short. Um, you know, and I think we do a good job of empowering players and coaches uh, to have something to strive for, to be, to be, you'll never be a hundred percent perfect, but if you go with the mindset of, I want to be a master at my craft, which goes back to the, uh, you know, talking about elite athletes, um, you know, sky's the limit at that point. Definitely. Uh, but I mean, as you said, but before you were there, you were working on a mouthpiece. So how much of just your personal preference or skill set was geared towards you wanting to work with data or was it more of a, from a safety angle? I mean, how did you fall into this trajectory? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I mean, it was kind of an interesting story. So once I retired, I, I took, uh, took a couple years off to kind of figure life out, right? Uh, you know, took a whole year off just to play golf. <laughs> uh, and that was kind of a passion of mine and that led me into the golf industry um and I, I i for some reason decided i wanted to be a gm at a country club or try to to do that so i went the pga route and i got you know pga certified and all these different things uh come to find out that i'd rather be the rich snobby guy that belongs to the country club <laughs> uh than actually working there so uh, um, i was lucky enough to get a phone call from the dallas cowboys uh, a couple years ago uh, to work in their front office and brand management. Uh, did that for a number of years, basically growing the business from a football standpoint um, without using the team. So, you know, when I joined, um, you know, one of my first things was to basically hire 
uh, any former player in the Dallas area uh, to help grow the business. The professional athlete, professional football player is, regardless of your affiliation with the team or not, um, is a powerful tool to use. And there's, I think, like 1,500 of us here in the Dallas area, so why not use it? Um, you know, and once uh, I got kind of into that, I always had this interest in maybe trying to get back into football to some degree, like the actual nuts and bolts of it. Um, but I always had an interest in data, so I, I was presented with the opportunity to, uh, to go to this other company um, and, and really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed trying to figure out how to solve this riddle, uh, even though I don't think anybody will ever solve it in terms of can't prevent concussions, can't, um, can't make a game like football or boxing or hockey, anything like that. Uh, you can't make a violent game nonviolent. That's just the reality of it. But I also believe that to to make the game safer, you need a complete picture, right? And that's where data comes in. I personally, and this is my belief, um, and this is something that we're working on at Avis with a bunch of other companies that we've been kind of going back and forth with, is to make any real rules change, make any real equipment change. I believe, and we believe that you need a complete picture, which means I want to know how big guys are, I want to know their body mass, I want to know how fast they're moving, I want to know where they come from, I want to know when they impact somebody is on that person, both giving and receiving, and then what techniques led to that happening. Um, and some of that is just in the blink of an eye, it happens, right? And there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but that's less than 1%, I think it's like 0.08% of, of those big hits, just there's nothing really you can do. But what about all the other ones? What about all the other sub-concussive hits that happen all the time. Is there a technique that maybe we can institute to, to change that? Um, is there a rule that needs to be changed? Um, and when you look at some of these rule changes on, on the NFL level and some of the stuff that some of the or other organizations are doing, uh, like USA football with modified tackle and all these different things, um, I think until you are able to piece it all together, it's, it's like an educated guess because you don't really know exactly what happened on that play um and so you know for me to to, to come to eight of us i'm able to take my knowledge previously from that other company with head impacts and kind of what that kind of looks like and then working with a couple of researchers um to now all right we have the data how do you stop that are you are we able to stop that do we need to make practice changes rule changes um and we're doing some pretty pretty exciting stuff you know we're, we're working with uh, the coaches association up in oklahoma uh, to, to basically mandate that all their coaches in the association get certified by, by us at Adibus. And part of that would be us taking a deep dive into why certain things happen in games and looking at all their, their game film and data. Um, something similar to what we did uh, with the Texas High School Association a couple of years ago, and, and that's still ongoing. Um, to me, when you look at the future of data and sports, that's kind of the route that I think everybody's going to start to go is how do you have a very holistic whole approach of looking at something and, and telling that story. Definitely. Yeah. And not, not to beat a dead horse here, but I, I love it. I, I think that it, it's a no brainer. And as time goes on, there's only going to be more, whether it's at a state level, you know, hopefully right country from high school, midget football. Although I, I mean, literally at every level, this is yeah. something that can impact you know, safety and just really work on having a better game. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, for the first time in a long time, and this started probably a couple of years ago, you know, the general public, you know, they're, they're asking questions. And I think, uh, unfortunately, the NFL is going to bear the brunt of it because, at least in everybody's eyes, there's the governing body of football in America, period. But they're having to answer questions. And, um, you know, people want answers. And I think here at eight of us, we're doing a good job of – giving answers to some of those questions and, and giving them some, some data that they can act upon to, to hopefully make the game safer. And, you know, at the elite level to perform even better, you look at some of our clients and you look at, you know, their efficiency of tackling has improved tenfold, you know, within the first year of using us. Um, you know, so if you can make the, the game safer for the athlete and your team and improve your tackling and improve your defense, um, I mean, I may be biased because I work for us, but I would say sign, sign me up for that. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I, although you may be a little bit biased as someone that came into this unbiased, I, I mean, hey, like I, I think it's a great idea. There, there's a you know huge demand for it that I think you're only going to see more and more of as time goes on. So 
again, I'm super excited for it. Uh, but Terrence, what I wanted to do now, right, you know, for us to have this conversation, you did a couple things to get here. Uh, you, you're wearing the, the Buffalo gear, which I love. But can we then just walk this a couple years back? You know, how do you even get to Colorado? So, I mean, if I have this right, you're a, by all means a very, you know, multidimensional athlete, track and field star. You're playing defensive back, wide receiver, maybe even a little returning in high school. I mean, what were you thinking, 17, 18 years old? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, first off, I wasn't even thinking uh... – wasn't even thinking football, to be honest with you. Um, I grew up running track. My parents ran track. Um, you know, my parents were Olympic caliber athletes in track. And so that's kind of what I, what I did. Um, and so for a long time, uh, really probably starting my sophomore year of high school, track started getting pretty serious uh, for me. And probably right around junior year, I had to make this decision of, do I decide to forego college, right, and skip it and, and, and go the Olympic route or – I entertain playing football. Um, and at that time, I didn't have a ton of offers. Um, and so luckily for me, I think right towards the end of my junior year or from uh, University of Arizona, uh, I got an offer from Tulsa, Arkansas, and Texas A&M. And I uh, fell in love with A&M. And, and part of that was just because or 7-on-7, uh, seven seven, the Texas State 7-on-7 seven seven championship was always at A&M, so I was always down there. Um, and I was going to commit to them. I was going to be one of their first commits. And unfortunately, uh, they – fired the head coach, they fired Coach Slocum. Um, and so for me, they, that, was, that was kind of the last straw for me, so I was out. Um, and so I took a, a visit up to, to Boulder. I went to a summer camp there. Again, I don't know nothing about Boulder. Uh, I'm not sure what they know about me. But uh, I do remember running the 40 once. Uh, I still, to this day, don't know what I ran. Uh, but I do remember Barnett coming over to me and telling me to sit down, uh, and he'll be right back. Uh, and within about 15 minutes, he came down with a letter, an offer. And was like, we would like to offer you and offer me on the spot. Wow. Um, and I guess the rest is kind of, kind of history. <laughs> now, did you run a, a sub four, three forty at any point? Uh, weren't you, were you hovering around like the four, two nines? Yeah, I ran, uh, I ran a sub four, three, a couple of times. Um, I, I, I think I ran it twice my junior year, once my senior year. Um, you know, when I got to the combine, I think I ran like a four, three, seven, four, three, five, or something like that, um, which is still flying. I mean, you, you look at a lot of these guys, I mean, and, and put it in perspective. I mean, if you are at hand time, you know, and you run four, two or four, three, that's probably really like a high four, four, maybe low four, five electronic. Uh, so when you go to the combine and you run less than four, four, you're, you're moving, you're moving hand time. You're, you're doing something that's pretty incredible. But, uh, but yeah, I've, I've done it a couple of times. So that decision then to, to move away from track and field, obviously your parents did it. It must have been something that was you know, very important to you. How hard was it for you to actually pick the football route? I mean, maybe once the offers came in, it was a little bit easier, but to, to make that initial decision. Yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those to where there was, <laughs> there was, there's more money in football. Let's just be honest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, and, and, and what I was doing in track, you know, I was a sprinter, but I didn't specialize in 100 or 200. I was a, I was a long jump, triple jump guy. Uh, not very glamorous, not a ton of money, not going to make a lot of money in sponsorship deals, even though I was talking to a couple sponsors at that time. Um, just, you know, I, I wanted the challenge. I wanted to go to school. Um, so for me, football made the most sense education-wise. Uh, but then financially, it's like, why not take a risk? Because worst case, I could go back. Track isn't going anywhere. Right. Uh, I could go back and, and run track. So um, it was difficult, but not, not overly difficult. And, and for the record, it, it is pretty much criminal to me that Olympic athletes, particularly guys in track and field, that there really is no professional league, that they can't have endorsements. They can't, you know, really monetize the biggest stage where you're competing against the world. Like, so insane the way that track and field gets treated. Yeah, it's um, it's it's not as glamorous anymore, and part of that's just because all these other sports are so mainstream now. Um, you know, it's just it's unfortunate, right? I mean, and, and even swimming's kind of the same way, where it was like a big deal right away. Um, but now you got like golf, and you got hockey, you got some of these other sports that are, you know, they're kind of taking the limelight away. But uh, you know, it's 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 one of those deals to where, you know, a lot of these guys are still still well off. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to hit 
fast forward for a little bit from the time you get to Boulder, right? You know, 2005, uh, you, you end up having to go um, in red shirt because of an injury. And then 2006, you know, it, it begins, you know, the Coach Hawkins era. So yep. just, just 05, 06, if I can kind of lump those two things together, you know, with just the term adversity, right? For, for yeah. you to be on this pathway where, where you, you're getting better, um, I mean, you go on to hit, um, you know, rank all time in Colorado with a lot of important marks for a defensive back. But how do you deal with the setback of, of you know, breaking your wrist? And, and then you, you see that the team success means that there's a new coach and a new staff that you have to get used to. Yeah, it was, uh, there's, a, there's a mental aspect to, to dealing with any type of injury as an athlete that I think is um, underappreciated. Um, and, and realistically, unless you're, you're, an athlete and you're, you know, trying to work to the ultimate uh, in, in your sport and, and dealing with an injury along the way, I, I think it'd be very difficult for anybody to understand. But for me, you know, my injury actually happened back in, in 04 in the spring. Um, and when I got to 05, at that point, I was trying to kind of play with it um, and ultimately went to a bunch of different doctors. And, and the first doctor I went to in Dallas, uh, you know, basically sat me down and basically told me my career was over. He was like, I've never seen uh, an injury this bad. He was like, I'm going to fuse your wrist. Uh, the bones in your wrist are essentially dying and falling apart because um, of lack of blood flow. Um, and so I guess the heart had nest in me decided to go get a second opinion. Um, and I was able to find a guy up in Vail, uh, Randall Viola, who, I mean, he, he, same thing, right? He'd never seen anything like it, but he was at least going to try. Um, and that's all I could ask. So you know, I, I think that year I had three different surgeries. I, I tried two different wrist fusions, a two bone fusion and a three bone fusion. Um, and ultimately, you know, I ended up with a completely fused wrist uh, after the 06, actually after the 05 season, I just went ahead and fused it completely uh, and went and did the red shirt, uh, wore a, a bone stimulator that's actually meant for your fibula <laughs> on my wrist uh, for, God, I think I wore it for like four months. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, adversity is to say the least, right? Because now you're, you, you see the, the coaching staff change that obviously, you know, I wasn't a, a huge fan of uh, at first. Uh, but then you have this injury to where you're unsure if you're ever going to play again. Um, and for me, my sophomore year is kind of when I started to kind of maybe think about the NFL. So that was, that was a kind of a bitter, bitter pill to swallow because it's kind of, it's not, it's not up to you. Um, but luckily I was able to, to come out of it and uh, it worked out. Yeah. So it, and to say you come out of it, right? Like 06, 07, I, I mean, you're, you're all conference. It, I mean, you, you really show, show up in play. So did you have in the back of your mind, like, am I maybe on borrowed time with my wrist? Am I always just going to be one hit away from this whole thing being over? Oh, absolutely. how do you just deal with that? You know, giving it your all with, with having this thing in the back of your head. Well, I mean, that's, that's the reality of it, right? Like I said earlier, I mean, football is a, a violent game. Um, it, it's kind of kind of funny and kind of strange, but uh, when I actually hurt my wrist initially, I didn't touch anybody. I, I was going up for interception, and uh, the receiver clipped my legs and flipped me, flipped me up in the air. So I put my hand down, and I just happened to fall on my wrist, and I flipped over, flipped over my hand. My hand was stuck underneath me. Oh. Um, so ever since then, you know, yeah, I, I had no idea if um, one tackle, uh, hell, I didn't even know if I fell down the stairs, <laughs> if I would break this thing again. That was just the, the nature of the beast, even though my wrist was completely fused and I had a, you know, a titanium plate put in. Um, funny story, the second, the second game my junior year, uh, I actually broke the titanium plate. Um, and I played the rest of the year with essentially uh, – a kind of a messed up fusion and a broken titanium plate in my wrist. And after my junior year, I went back in, took that plate out and put a stainless steel plate in, even though it's technically a little bit weaker, it doesn't flex as much. So the, the stress failure is a little bit different. Um, and it's a little bit thicker, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, it's, it's, it's a mental game because you just, you don't know when it's over. Um, but it also makes it that much more enjoyable because, you know, there is a, there is an end point uh, for all athletes, especially football players. But for me, you know, it was, it was pretty real, pretty, pretty early on. Now, when you go through, cause like I said, right. Um, those two years after you have to redshirt, you know, you do great on the field. I'm sure 
it's less of a concern. You, you know, you really feel confident that it's going to hold up just because, you know, two good years of it holding up, even if you did have to have the plate replaced, like, you're like, Hey, you know what? I, I got this. Like we're going to be all right here during the draft scrutiny. How, how much did every team just, uh, you know, interrogate you over this? Uh, well, you'd be surprised. Some, some teams actually, even though they've never seen it, they understood it. Um, so, you know, New England and Bill, it, it wasn't an issue for them, right? They, they knew I had some injury concerns in college, but technically it was one thing. Um, and I played two years with it um, and played really well. Uh, like you said, I had a bunch of records and still have some records uh, with, for interceptions. I think a bulk of my interceptions came essentially with a fused wrist. Yeah, right. Um, you know, so it wasn't really that big of a deal. I did kick return. I have records for that. Um, but then there, there were other teams that just never seen it, don't want to touch it. I'm unsure of it. There's, I think I was one of the first guys ever in my position to, to play with a fused wrist. Um, I think I'm one of a few ever to play in the NFL with a, fused, a completely fused wrist. Um, so some teams just were like, no, don't trust it, unsure, never seen it. Um, you know, so kudos to, uh, to New England for at least trusting me, at least with, with that hand. <laughs> Uh, obviously that didn't work out because obviously my, my rookie year, I, I dislocate the other wrist. Um, and there goes kind of the whole ball game, right? Because that was kind of my deal was I had learned to play uh, with essentially my left hand being my dominant hand playing press coverage. And all of a sudden you do the same thing to your left one. Now I can't, I have to literally change the way I'm trying to play. Oh, wait a minute. But this is also at the highest level of sport. Uh, that's, that's a pretty difficult task to do. So how, how do you, and we've already talked about dealing with adversity and setback, but to have that happen, right? How, how do you, because th this is just a new layer of it. It's not like, this isn't the same thing now, you know, you're essentially going to be asked to completely reinvent your style. I, I mean, how do you deal with like, you finally make it to the biggest stage, you, you know, you're a high draft pick. You know, how do you deal with that in like, oh, by the way, this happens the same year that Tom Brady goes down. It's like all of New England's in despair. I, I mean, the, the sky was essentially falling up here. You know, yeah. <laughs> what's just the, the, the roller coaster of the, the high of getting drafted in to finally realize these dreams and then to have that happen your rookie year? It's, it's rough, right? I mean, you know, number one, after the wrist injury, you don't think you're going to get drafted, period. I uh, don't think you make it to the NFL, but to – get drafted in the second round, even with all that, um, was like a weight being lifted off your shoulders. Um, you know, and then you finally get your first start. Your first starts against Peyton Manning in Indy. You know, Bill comes to you and basically says, hey, your assignment for this week is you have Marvin Harrison and wherever he goes, you're going. Um, and obviously as a rookie, I'm kind of sitting here like, future Hall of Famer, are you sure? Um, <laughs> You know, but I was playing well, right? He, um, he tried me a couple times, and he didn't catch anything. Um, and I felt my confidence kind of grow as the game kind of was, uh, was going on. And then, obviously, you, uh, you dislocate your wrist. And I obviously know the feeling. So as soon as it happened, I knew exactly what I did. Um, and then your mind kind of starts to, to race, right? It's kind of like, crap, do we, we go, are we going down the same route, right? And now it's beyond football. Right. You know, it's 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 tough enough to, to live a normal life with one rest that doesn't do anything. Um, but now is there a possibility I might have the same issue with my left hand? Um, you know, I have other things I would like to do besides play football. Um, and I was just unsure about that. And, um, you know, it's 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 kind of a kind of a rough go of it for a couple of months until you kind of, you know, like you said, now you're trying to reinvent everything you do more or less on the field. And obviously, I, I try to go back and try to change the way I play a little bit. Um, and it's just it's hard. Yeah, I, I mean, I can only imagine. Um, so let's get rid of the, this negative tone that I, that I might have uh, uh, cast on us for a second here. You know, you're playing on a team in the Patriots where you get a, a best of all time at quarterback, you know, maybe not for your entire tenure with the Patriots, but at Welker and, you know, Randy Massa there, I mean, just trying to become a professional when you have literally some of the best ever to do it that you're going against. How much did that force you to try to up your game in a hurry? Oh, you don't have a choice. That's, uh, that's the NFL number one. Uh, and then that's new England number two. Um, everybody gets drafted there for a reason. Um, 
and again, that's any NFL team, but New England in particular, if, if you get drafted there, you're there for a reason. If you get picked up as a free agent, if you get picked up as an unsigned free agent, there is something they see that they like, um, and that's just a matter of you doing it. And so, you know, being around guys like Wes and Tom and Randy, uh, Galeas Thomas, uh, Rodney Harrison, Teddy Bruschi, Larry, I mean, the list goes on. Um, they're there for a reason, right? And, and they are good for a reason. They do things a certain way. They talk a certain way. They act a certain way. Um, and that's why they win, <laughs> right? Um, and so for me, as a rookie, I learned really quick on how to practice, how to talk, how to conduct yourself on and off the field, how to manage expectations, um, and, and try to take all that in. I mean, people people forget, you know, your longest year as an NFL player is your rookie year because you don't you don't, there is no break. Um, you know, after your collegiate career is over, typically you go to an all-star game. After the all-star game, you're in training. Training goes to the combine. Combine goes to more training, to the draft, straight to rookie mini camp. And here's the playbook, and you figure it out, and you're rocking and rolling the first day. Um, and that's a lot. But, um, you know, I think New England did a really good job of surrounding the young guys uh, with, with, with some of the old, older guys that had seen a lot, uh, been on numerous teams, understood the culture, bought into the culture. Um, like I said, that's kind of why they win. <laughs> Definitely. And you spoke a lot there about um, whether you want to say, you know, tribute to you know, Robert Kraft or Bill Belichick, but, but the culture and how they built New England, uh, something that they've, you know, essentially been for 20 years now. Can you speak at all to, you know, what made or uh, how Bill has earned his reputation of not just the, the culture and the team builder, but the defensive guru? I mean, was there anything in particular that you can put your finger on for just what he was able to do to help the, the team week in and week out, um, particularly yeah. just on the over, overall defense side? Yeah, it's um, – Bill is, Bill is very, very intelligent. But I always tell people Bill is also not an idiot. <laughs> And I mean that in the, the nicest way, right? So the analogy that I always give people is, if you were going to play the Bulls in the 90s, who are the top three guys you're going to stop? And it's probably going to be Jordan, it'll be Pippen, and then you can either pick Rodman or you can pick Kerr or whatever how the team was built at that time. We did the same thing on defense. You're not going to let your star players beat us doing what they were drafted to do. So as an example, let's say you're getting ready to play the Cleveland Browns right now. We will double Odell all day, and we'll make somebody else beat us. And, and Bill believed in that. Bill thought it'd be very foolish to let your star player, your big-name player, just come in and do whatever he wants. So let's take a deep dive into your top players. Let's figure out their top routes. How do we combat that? And if you beat us doing – stuff that you do 5% of the time, 6% of the time, 8% of the time, high job, you're a great coach. Uh, but if you beat us doing stuff you do 90% of the time, then that's on us. We shouldn't allow you to do that, right? And that's how we operated with every team, regardless. We, we figured out who the top guys were, who the guys were that struggled in certain situations, and we exposed that. Um, and they continue to do that on the defensive level. And, and realistically, it translates to the same on offense. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it, you know, just to wrap up your NFL career, uh, you know, your time with the Patriots is by no means the end of your NFL journey. You know, you do go on uh, time with, with Jacksonville, time with Buffalo, time with the Titans. Can you just speak a little bit about what your thought process was for that, you know, two to three year stretch of just sort of like, getting signed with these teams, trying to learn the coaches, the new area, the playbook, and then, okay, well, something else. While all the while trying to, you know, <laughs> work on that, you know, reworking your, your game, just coming yeah. back from that injury without really getting a lot of time on the field. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot to be able to, to change teams. Um, you know, the biggest change that a lot of people don't understand is the terminology is, is entirely different, like learning a new language. Um, even though the defense – for the most part, cover two is cover two, cover three is cover three. It's, it's very, very simple. Um, but the way that they talk is different. The way that they look at data, the way they look at plays and scatter reports is different. Um, and so 
on top of that, you're trying to find a new place to live and you're trying to get rid of your old place and all these different things. Um, as you said, meanwhile, still trying to reinvent your game uh, based on your injuries, uh, keeping in mind that you're getting older uh, is, is, a, is a lot to, uh, to deal with. But, you know, I enjoyed my time with, with all my teams. And, and now that I'm retired, I'm able to go back and look at each team and organization and really kind of piece together why certain teams are great and why certain teams and certain people um, struggle. Right. And it's a very much a top down approach. And I've been able to, uh, to use that to my benefit to be successful off the field. Um, a lot of things that I learned, not only at New England, but at Jacksonville and Buffalo and Tennessee, uh, both right and wrong, um, has directly translated uh, to me off the field in, in my career. So at a high level, then, given the fact that you've been able to use hindsight to really think about those different organizations, what works and what doesn't. If you were in charge of, you know, putting together this new organization, you know, we could go in on forever about the different details, but, you know, what are just a couple key things that you think are must haves for top notch organizations to exist and win? Yeah. So the first thing is you, you always have to have strong leadership, right? And, and I know that sounds very, I guess, fundamental, <laughs> but what is, what is leadership? Um, and when you look at New England, it was a lead by example, as opposed to talking, talking, anybody could talk. But um, I always was a firm believer in I rather show you and help you along the way, as opposed to just tell you and bark orders, because depending on the person, they may not respond to that. Number one, they may not understand what you're saying. But if you literally show somebody, then there's no gray area. Right. Um, and so that's number one. Number two is communication. Um, going back to New England and some of these other teams that I played for, uh, in the NFL, it's pretty pretty clear where you stand <laughs> on the 53-man roster, right? Either you're, you're the starter, you're number two on the depth chart, or you're on the roster bubble. Um, clear line of communication is, is key, right? Um, knowing where you stand, knowing what expectations are. Um, those are probably the top two things that I think, even though it's obvious, aren't utilized to their full potential, right? I, I, I'm a firm believer, again, in this is what I expect, but I'm gonna show you what I expect as well, and, and just drawing those clear lines. Um, otherwise, then, you know, people are just gonna be unsure of what to do and how to do it. Um, and that's just where mistakes, mistakes happen. Yeah, I, I mean, it's funny because it, it's obvious, right? But if it was so obvious, why doesn't every team do it? It's one of those things that we inherently kind of know, but for some reason we can kind of get just lost up in how you know we're doing our day to day. That you know, some of that stuff gets kind of forgotten about or overlooked. And also, does that not translate to success in any company in any industry ever? Right? Good leadership, yeah. clear, concise communication. I, I mean, it should be the fundamental building blocks. You would think, you would think, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we all know that that is not the case. But, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to, you know, play in the NFL and be around great teams and a couple of bad teams. And I've had the opportunity to to work uh, for great organizations and others not so much. But um, they all kind of scream the same things. The ones that are really good, um, great leadership, great communication, clear, concise objectives and goals. Um, and other ones you know, it's kind of up in the air, right? It's kind of up to you as an individual to, to come up with your own, I, you know, own goals, own thoughts. Um, and, and sometimes that's just not the way it needs to be done. I love it. Uh, well, Terrence, I, I, I want to end this show on what I call the gauntlet. It's just a couple quick hitter questions that I need your knee jerk answer on. <laughs> you got to right, tell let's me. let's do it. What's most important? Is it having the number one offense or the number one defense? Defense. I thought that you'd go that route. Now, favorite football memory? Favorite football memory is probably getting drafted, for sure. And you know what? Shame on me for not asking. Was it Bill that gave you the call? Was it Mr. Kraft? How did you find out? Uh, Bill gave me the call. Uh, he gave me the call when Dallas was on the clock. Um, I had interviewed and worked out for Jerry. Um, and basically, he called me and was like, hey, Dallas is on the clock. If they don't take you, then we're taking you. He hung up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, Pre-game ritual. Did you have one? Pre-game pre ritual for me was I always had to be, I think, 
either the first or second guy coming out for warm-ups, even though it would be, like, stupidly early, right? Because typically the kickers and punters are out there really early. But I would always have to be one of the first ones out there. And typically I would – and this goes back all the way to high school, uh, where we walked the field in high school. I would start on one end, and I would just walk all the way down to the other, all the way back, and that was something I've always done. Now, was there a player or a coach that you just wish you would have had the chance to play with? Oh, man, that's a toughie. Uh, that's a toughie. You know, I would have really have probably loved to probably play with Peyton, probably. Played against him. That's that's not fun. But uh, maybe play, playing, playing with him would have probably been pretty cool. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, an offense that would likely carry you. You make your job a little bit easier on defense. Yeah, well, having time wasn't bad either, so. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, now, what's most important? Is it the players or is it the scheme? I mean, ultimately, it's the players. Scheme is scheme is great, but uh, they're if you if you have guys that can't execute the scheme, then what's the point? <laughs> As I've heard many times on this program, it's the Jimmys and Joes, not the X's and O's. Exactly. <laughs> now, the, the very last one, and I think it's most important, considering everything that you've accomplished, what is the best piece of advice that you would give to a young student athlete that wants to get to you know, ultimately where you were able to go? Perseverance is, uh, is something that I kind of live my life by. Um, things may not go your way. Um, you may hear the word no a lot, um, but it's your life. It's, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, you know, I, I persevered through a lot. Uh, most athletes have, most successful people have. Yeah. Uh, there is no easy road. There is no get rich quick scheme unless you happen to win the lottery, which would be great. I would gladly take some money. Um, but outside of that, yeah, just be, just have perseverance, right? It's, it's, it's not going to always be easy, but, uh, that's what makes you the best. There it is from someone that's walked the walk. Terrence, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. This is fun.